Good morning. This is Amy Webster here from Motif Music Studios and Melissa Slocum. And we are really excited to be here to talk about co-regulation and the power of connection. It's a topic that's really dear to both of our hearts. And you'll hear more of why it's so important to us as we work alongside students and how that's impacted our families. But we're just really glad to be here today. So thank you, Melissa, for joining me. I am so thrilled to have these conversations and, you know, you and I love talking about a lot of different things, but we both have a lot of passion around these ideas. So I'm excited. Yeah, wonderful. So we'll just pop on some quotes. I put my computer a little far away from me. I'm just realizing <laughs> here. So as people join us, if you're joining here in the chat, you can let us know where you're joining from and say hello. So we're glad you're here and we see the first of you are already arriving. So that's really special to us. So also you can feel free to ask questions um, as you introduce yourself. If questions come up during the broadcast, whether you're you're here live or in the replay. Those are also wonderful. And we don't claim to have the answers to everything. This is coming from curious music teachers who have lived life and worked alongside students, but are learning ourselves as well. Hey, Melissa. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking as we started today that we could actually chat about, because we're going to dive into what co-regulation is why it's so important to connect with students as a first priority of safety and regulation. But I also thought it might be helpful for us to ponder us at our most regulated. So mm -hmm. when you're feeling your most calm and your most able to learn, what does that look like for you? So Melissa and I, we can kind of brainstorm too, and you can let us know in the comments when you feel at your most calm. What do you think, Melissa? I love you know, this, this idea of taking our own experience and, you know, thinking through what that looks like and feels like for us, mm -hmm. for me personally. So like you, I have a closet desk here, so I'm going to reach in front of me. I have um, a meditation stone that I use and I keep it really handy so that I can do my breathing and I can do my meditation and I can center myself and I can just be grounded. This is a grounding stone for me. And so for me, when I'm my most calm, regulated self, I've done some breathing work. Mm -hmm. I've done some meditation and I've centered myself and I've prepared myself and said, what is it that I need to learn in this moment? Yeah. Wow. And then I can move from there. Yeah, that's wonderful. So I love that you touch on that aspect of like connecting to something outside yourself, which is big for lots of people to be thinking of something that they can touch or see or feel or hear. So lot, there's lots of links that our senses can help us regulate. So I love that you touched on that right away. And then that aspect of breath. And I know mm -hmm. that you have some strategies later on in this live stream too, yeah. of some different ways of breathing, which is telling our nervous system to calm down and that things are going to be okay. So I love that. So Heidi is here again from BC, a fellow British Columbian in Canada here. So welcome, Heidi. Welcome, and we Heidi. And we hope this is inspiring and maybe not so as inspiring as to keep you up too late at night or cause any <laughs> unusual injuries. <laughs> uh, so it's good to have you here today. So, so Amy, what does it look like for you when you are calm and regulated? That's a great question because honestly, I've realized through working alongside my students and my children that I am pretty high intensity. And I love that we learn that about ourselves and we yeah. think, oh, yeah, I never thought that about myself. Um, I think that definitely breath work as well mm -hmm. for me has been more intentional in this season of my life and realizing that I can actually control my heart rate through mindful breath. So that's important for me. I also yeah. find like sometimes finding my way into a book and that's something I haven't done mm. for years, but I used to be a very avid reader. So I'm starting to bring that back again and go, oh, you know, if I can immerse myself in this world, it actually does help me find more regulation. So 
Um, and then actually, I think I co-regulate a lot with other people. I am an sure. empath. So mm -hmm. I think that that sometimes can also be dysregulating because you're kind of carrying yeah. the stressors of other people. But that's something else that's really joy filled and calming for me. Yeah. So I love that. So we are getting into defining all these wonderful things we're talking today about the power of connection first. And it's supposed to be a fresh perspective as you work along students. I see we have some more comments here. I love it. Oh, Heidi's just sharing our, <laughs> our inside joke here <laughs> about inspiration that can happen at all hours of the Sorry day. Sorry about that, Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so let's dive in. And I'm so excited. Thank you for being here. So when working alongside students as a teacher, I often thought that I just had to dive into music making because I yeah. wanted to maximize the value I was giving to families and the value I was giving to students. Mm -hmm. So I have this like fast paced energy as a teacher and I would think I'm not wasting one minute of this lesson. So I don't yeah. know if any of you feel that too, that sometimes- Hands up, me too, same thing. Yeah, so sometimes for me, um, setting the stage for regulation has meant me slowing myself down and realizing that that power of connection has to be prioritized in order to bring and maximize the impact of the instruction. Mm -hmm. So it's been a shift of thinking this is valuable. This aspect of regulation actually now takes top priority in my teaching practice. So I've loved that challenge. It's been a big one. So I'll remove this. We'll get straight into questions. Um, so Melissa, can you, we're going to define a few things first as we dive in. Can you help us define social emotional learning as we start out? Yeah. And this is something that I just started really digging into in the last few years. And I started with growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are familiar with growth mindset yeah. and changing the language that we use about ourselves and that we use about our learning and our capacity to learn. Yeah. And uh, we change sometimes very simple phrases. And, and one of the most powerful is yet using the words yet. Mm -hmm. um, so when a child, you know, or a student, or if I say, oh, I don't know how to do this. Um, we can, from growth mindset language, learn, well, I don't know how to do this yet, mm -hmm. but I can learn. Yeah. And from growth mindset language, I grew into finding social emotional learning, which is more about how we express our emotions, especially the big emotions that we feel in a social setting. And so when social emotional learning is happening, usually it's between two or more people, sometimes a large classroom or a group class, sometimes it can be one-on-one. -on -one. And usually that social emotional learning looks like some vehicle that we are using, whether it's music or drawing pictures, or it might be using rhythm instruments, something where we are expressing our emotions Mm -hmm. and learning how to express our emotions appropriately in a particular setting. And there can be a lot of great ways to do this. Mm -hmm. um, I, for example, in my studio, use a lot of uh, YouTube videos from a wonderful little group called Narwhals and Waterfalls. And they're a group that is known for creating SEL uh, music that is really just wonderful. Some of the music that I have when I'll just have it playing when students walk into my studio, it might be about breathing. Mm -hmm. They have some wonderful music about just breathing techniques. Um, they have wonderful songs just about, you know, saying hello and being able to say hello. Uh, yeah. You know, what a great message when we walk in to say hello and say someone's name and connect to them that way. So social emotional mm -hmm. learning, it's sort of, it's sort of like Mr. Rogers, but <laughs> yeah. for the new for the new era, right? Yeah. So yeah. I feel like that's SEL in a nutshell. If you knew Mr. Rogers, that's SEL, and that's you know what a lot of groups and a lot of teachers are using in their classrooms today. Yeah. So I love that you touch on right away just having aspects of your classroom be welcoming and have little bits of structure in it. And I will 
as something that's important to my heart with social emotional learning, just tell teachers that it's really important to listen to the autistic voices in our community. Yes. And so some of the things I make sure that we're not speaking over those voices, because sometimes we like to communicate in neurotypical ways, mm -hmm. instead of uh, atypical ways. So that's just a disclaimer as we get into that topic but I love that right away you incorporate music in there and ways that we can connect um, and right I was going to ask can you define can you share you know we throw around the term neurodivergent a lot can you share what that is and that your definition yeah, it is. I was digging into it because I thought, well, we all have this like umbrella idea. So in my thoughts, I think about someone who their actual brain wiring is different. Um, and that's a bigger umbrella. It includes um, being autistic. And I use that term just as the adult community. Some will say a person with autism. But in mm -hmm. my community, the adults are saying, hey, we are autistic. So I've been okay. using that. But I know it's different for each person. And then uh, ADHD is actually under that mm -hmm. umbrella of neurodiversity and giftedness falls mm -hmm. under that as well. So it actually can be a number of different neurotypes that can present in different ways. And we, yeah, we'll dig into that more. And I think that's why the social emotional learning can be so critical because there are so many things in the neurodivergent population that are difficult to express, whether it's emotions or just being able to communicate, you know, that you're thirsty, even yeah. um, those can be very difficult to communicate. And I think it's important for us as music educators in our studios to learn how to recognize all these things, which is why I'm so excited about this conversation today. Absolutely. And uh, you touched on a really important point that it's a lot about, too, as instructors, I feel learning how to communicate in different ways ourselves. So one of the big quotes that impacted me was something called behavior is communication um, by Ross Green. Yes. Um, and I think that that is another cue for empathy, because sometimes we see students present in ways that are not typical behaviors that you might see and think, wow, this child is rebellious or this child is disorganized disruptive we can we can title all these things but when we look at it in a term of regulation and then how we can co-regulate first as a priority then we actually can meet the need of the student and not just stop the behavior so that's what we're going to be talking about today for yeah. sure and the beautiful thing about this i feel like too is it's not just something for the neurodivergent community or the autistic yes. community it works with everyone you know yeah. whether you're neurotypical or neurodivergent or whether you have certain things that are challenges for you or not this, all of this just feels good for everyone. So it's not something that it's like, oh, here's my neurodivergent student. So I have to do this today. Yeah. It's something you can incorporate with everyone. And that's yeah. beautiful. Absolutely. And that's been life changing seriously in my studio as I look at behavior through a new lens. And I think, mm -hmm. wow, we actually can impact students and in so doing impact our work and our aspect of regulation because we start noticing things. Um, so we're kind of going to chat uh, emotional regulation and co-regulation. Yes. And I love your definitions of co-regulation and I love how you describe this. Can you share that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we'll dive into three terms that to me are important to understanding co-regulation and regulation. But when I think of emotional regulation, I feel like it's a state where the, the brain is at rest or able to learn because the different systems in the body are being addressed in important ways. So I feel like it's a brain that's ready to learn. And yes. if our brains are not ready to learn because of the sensory demand on us or inner body needs or high anxiety, your, your brain and your body cannot communicate properly. So as part of that, I thought I would show and add to this stream three different topics under that that I think is important to address. So one is our sensory system and my eyes are... Um, 
there we go. <laughs> so the sensory <laughs> system, part of the nervous system responsible for processing sensory information and commonly recognized would be things like vision, hearing, taste, smell, and balance. I see I said b -b -b balance. That's fun. <laughs> Your sensory system impacts the way you feel the world around you. So again, as educators, when we see a student walk in the room, they're experiencing our space different than we are. So I think when it comes to regulation, you think, well, we might not come into a room and be so overwhelmed by the smell or the colors or things like that. But someone else could be coming in and that is so dysregulating that their body is turning to flight, fight, or mm -hmm. freeze. So yeah. when you see a child suddenly start racing around your studio and you're going, wow, this is disruptive. You are not allowed to do that. It's actually their brain getting upregulated and unable to sit mm -hmm. and learn because their body's saying, whoa, I am really overstimulated. And sometimes that can be excitement. It's not always anxiety. Yeah. But and by the same token, I, I've seen students who also do the opposite. Instead of kind of running around, they shut down and get very still. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you address that because that freeze behavior too, or that student that mm -hmm. suddenly is unable to speak. And that's why we'll go into different ways of communicating alongside a student. It doesn't have to be verbal. Um, so there's going to be different things like that. So then the regulatory system, our organs working together. Um, to maintain that internal and external balance. So regulation happens as our body responds to those fluctuations. And again, some people will have a more sensitive regulatory system that's going to go out of balance more easily and is going to be very stressful in a learning situation. I also find students now um, are transitioning really quickly. I don't know if you find that in your studio as well, but there may be transitioning from a very sensory loaded classroom, whether you're typical or atypical, and you're you're coming rushed out of, you maybe haven't had time to go to the bathroom or to have a snack. Melissa is going to tell us more mm -hmm. of that in a second. Mm -hmm. um, so our regulatory system involves all those things, respiratory and endocrine systems. Then our interoceptive system is one of the most difficult because it's nerve receptors all over our bodies, including our internal organs, bones, muscles, and skin. And they are sending information all the time to our brain to determine how we feel. So these are really big topics. So if you in the audience have questions about that, you can pop them into the comments. But Melissa, what are ways that you in your studio, you have some really special ways of addressing some of those sensory needs as people come into your studio, what does that look like for you? Yes. So uh, the first thing is, and, and it's probably hard to see um, from this particular shot mm -hmm. in my studio, but uh, I actually um, took time today to dim my lights in my studio and I turned on some soft lighting with a lamp. I also have blackout curtains yes. that I can pull closed if I need to for um, just to, to kind of minimize the light or to give a cozier feel to the studio so that if we need to tone it down for yeah. a student visually, we can soften the lighting, we can soften just the environment. We don't have to have it full on bright, you know, with the curtains open and the lights on full blast. We can really just create a more subtle lighting environment. And if you have the opportunity to do that in your studio, mm -hmm. it really, really can help some students that might be overwhelmed even by light, or even yeah. if a student has a headache. I mean, sometimes just like, oh, we're going to tone down the, the lighting. We're going to tone down the volume. We're going to just tone things down for you today. Yeah. And I find that that's a great way um, to be able to address that particular sensory need. Yeah. The other thing that I have in my... Um, studio that I use. And we, I think, have a link to this. I actually have a little emoji sheet that I put in a sheet protector. And there's yeah. two sides. And the faces are just emojis. And I ask students, what are your two emojis today? You yeah. know, what are you feeling right now? And it's okay if you have more than two. It's okay if you have one. It's okay if you can't identify any. Yeah. And it's okay if they're not verbal because they can just point, right? Mm -hmm. And say, oh, I'm feeling silly today. Yeah. Or 
you know, how many students do we get after school who are tired and hungry? (laughs) And so when I know that about a student, yeah, I, if, you know, if a student comes in and they're like, Oh, I'm super hungry, Miss Melissa, and I'm really tired. Well, guess what? If we need to, I have a snack bin and I keep this, you know, not out so that students can grab it right away Mm -hmm. when they walk in, but I keep it handy and say, you know, I have a little bit of water. Would you like a bottle of water before we start, you know, or do you need a little granola bar? I keep allergy free snacks for some students. I keep other snacks, but they're healthy, you know, crackers and cheese or or granola bars or things that are allergy free and some Mm -hmm. water. I keep some Kleenexes, you know, just in case. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just one of those things that when you know what a student is dealing with when they first walk in, you can do so much to help. And even if it's not a physical need, like I'm hungry or thirsty, or I have a headache, even if it's not a physical need, Mm -hmm. sometimes they'll say, I'm sad. Yeah. You know, because of something that happened on the playground or something else that they've heard about. So you can already start to co-regulate with students when you have an idea of what they're walking in with. And sometimes I will ask them, would you like me to share my two emojis first? Yeah. And then I'll say, hmm, what am I feeling? So I'm going to do a quick scan. What do I feel? Hmm. I feel kind of silly today, but I also feel excited and happy to be here with you. Mm -hmm. So this little tool has done a lot for me in my particular studio. The other thing I keep handy for a sensory need, I keep little plushies in my studio. Oh, I love it. And so I bought these this last summer because, you know, who doesn't need a hug from a hedgehog? I know, right? You know, or who doesn't want to pick up and play with a little dinosaur? Yeah. Right? See? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So... I have students who I had a girl who came in last night and she was just exhausted and um, she picked out uh, the sloth and said, you know, can I just sit and hold the sloth? And I said, absolutely. I love it. Absolutely. Because she said, this is how I feel. I feel sloth like today. It's Thursday. <laughs> like oh absolutely. And yeah. then when she wasn't holding it, she put it on the rack while she was playing her piece. Yeah. And then while we would do something else, she would just pick it up and hold it again. Yeah. Again, that can be a very sensory kind of thing. And she's not neurodivergent that I'm aware of, mm-hmm. but okay, if it works for her, it works for her. So mm-hmm. I love having plushies, not just um, you know, we use them for all sorts of games and rhythm things too. Yeah but just as a comfort, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I love that right away we touched on because we're talking like knowing how to observe student needs and then meeting needs. So right away when we're talking about co-regulation and we haven't quite defined it, but we're getting there, is that firstly starting with that empathy step. So first of all here, we've been talking about what like just observing needs of the people around you. And it actually Mm -hmm. doesn't matter what age they are. Some things we might deem as more age uh, developmentally appropriate. And we might be more used to seeing a toddler have a stress time of a meltdown. We might not be as expecting it with an older child. But as we lean into empathy and saying, okay, there are things here that we can't see. And I think that's what we're talking about when we think of those different sensory needs and regulatory systems. We're saying there are invisible things happening in every person we meet, every student we work with. So that aspect of co-regulation starts with observing and that empathy step of thinking there's bigger things at play here and then I loved how Melissa's action plan uh, is to be aware of the things you can do to adapt your environment for students coming in and I know I do similar things even though now I'm online I can't offer snacks in the same way but I can often send them for something that's comforting for them or say, oh, are you thirsty? Oh, do you feel like you want to move your body? I also love how Melissa showed she has the emoji sheet that people can choose or point to an emoji. What a beautiful thing to do. So, uh, Melissa, just for fun, maybe if you are in the live stream right now, can you tell us what your two emojis would be if you were to choose them for today? (laughs) So what would your emojis be today, Melissa? Mine are, okay, let me see. 
well, I'm excited. Where is excited? Oh, I'm excited because I'm yeah. excited about this conversation and I yeah. love talking to you. Yeah. And I am actually kind of feeling silly today because I've just already had a wonderful, fun day and I've already had a chance to, I was working, I had a call with another teacher um, yeah. earlier, a colleague, mm -hmm. and I got to get out my fun puppets and talk about piano safari and use my puppets already today. So I'm yeah. kind of silly and I'm like, I need to use these more often in my lessons. Um, and so again, it's just like, you know, I'm a little bit silly today just because I've gotten a chance to play with puppets. How fun is that? That's amazing. How about you? What are your two yeah. emojis today? I love it. I'd have to admit that tired is one of them for today. I did have a migraine last night, so I'm a little bit more tired today. But I also have this spark of inspiration because this topic mm. is so dear to my heart yeah. that I get very excited. I put our disclaimer up because this isn't yes. us talking um, we have carefully researched this topic. It comes from our experience in our homes as well as alongside students, but we're not therapists or medical professionals. So we love to say that. Um, so let's take a little moment to, um, let's see. Um, we've gone, we've been just doing this off script, but following yeah. it so beautifully. So I love that. And I hope that if you're in here in the chat, that this is a topic that will spark some creativity. And I love that Heidi was saying she has stuffed animals too. And a lot mm -hmm. of you are already doing these beautiful things, co-regulating with students. But I love that we can always become more intentional. And so can I love you that. go back and define now co-regulation? Yes, absolutely. So yeah. developmentally, when often we skip ahead to regulation or self-regulation. Mm -hmm. So we we think to a student, we say, you need to calm down or you need to slow your body down or you need to focus. And we come kind of with demands that would be someone with a mature system and just placing, placing an expectation. And of course, that's the end goal as adults, that there's lots of things that we can do to self-regulate. Mm -hmm. But one of the most beautiful things is that uh, co-regulation actually has to happen first developmentally. So right. like an infant that cries, they're actually needing co-regulation. They're needing, they like actually synchronized heartbeats. And this, mm -hmm. my first awareness of that was I have a very high sensory child. And when I would be nursing him, if I slowed my own breath down, his breath would start to slow. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. So I'd actually practice that. I'd go, oh, and I'd let out a big sigh. And then we do it again. And I thought, oh, my Wonderful. goodness. And so just like slowing breath, breathing mm -hmm. and being in community, connection in the way the student needs, because I'll say that an eye contact conversation with two energized people like Melissa and I is not <laughs> co-regulating for everyone. <laughs> um, Absolutely. But for some it is. So co-regulation is that beautiful thing of coming alongside someone, meeting them in their needs and and connecting. So I brought some of my things today that are co-regulating. Yeah, some share your things. favorite co-regulation strategies because I have one too, but I want to see yours. And these are not even, because I'm online, these are just things we use in our home and they're random because they actually belong to a need of a student or a child of mine. So for instance, these are little colorful blocks. Yes. They look like Minecraft blocks. Mm -hmm. And for one of mine, it is the most peaceful thing in the world to stack color coded blocks. Oh. That is co-regulating yes. for him. So it might look like me going, hmm, Let's stack them. Do you want to stack all the orange together? Oh, okay. And I just follow and mm -hmm. I just place them there. The other thing about co-regulating that's important to note is it can't always be an agenda. Mm -hmm. And as teachers, it's really hard not to start using a special interest as a a form of bribery or manipulation. So that's something important to me too, that it comes with no strings attached. It comes with me just being and existing together in somebody else's interest. For some of mine, it's farm animals. Mm -hmm. So 
we might spend a year singing old McDonald's farm <laughs> and we might, that might be how we co-regulate and connect is using a song or a special interest that's very important to that student or the child. The other thing that I almost always have handy is Lego. This is a specific mm. Lego kit, yes. but even just Lego bricks can be very regulating. They click together they can choose the colors that match. They can make a pattern. It's usually not a kit. It's just brick by brick. So for some students coming into a studio setting, that might be something that they need before they're ready to learn. Or we might be learning and listening to music at the same time. The other thing is an interest that they know a lot about. So for some of mine, it might be Minecraft. <laughs> so I have yes. these little die oh, cast. Awesome. Minecraft characters I and love that. I have to get pretty creative being online but I find that the students can bring things that match and we can share that together mm -hmm. and I also can reduce my lighting I've got my bright light but some mm -hmm. of my students I teach in the dark mm -hmm. the other thing I will do is I will turn my camera to my keys because it's very intense right. I have a very excited face and a lot of eye contact and a few of mine I can tell the moment I turn my camera to my keys, ah, relaxation and regulation can start to happen. I'm so glad you said that because I feel like a lot of online teachers get very offended when someone turns their camera off. Yes. And, you know, until you kind of learn that, oh, no, that's that's a self-regulation mechanism that this person is using and it's okay um, it's really easy to be offended by it when it's not really you and it's not really them being rude. It's just they're trying to regulate. They're trying to minimize the amount of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that, again, that empathy step that I mar um, have a little slide here for you to read if you're in the audience. But yes, acknowledging that it's not about us and somebody mm -hmm. who's actually able to express that they're not ready to be on camera or they're not ready to talk yet when they come into your studio. To me, those are uh, check engine lights. And mm -hmm. so when you're looking at strong behaviors, I try to say we're our best tactic is looking for not the strong behaviors, watching for the small clues. So as you enter a state where you're co-regulating first, your priority is connecting in the student's language. And so that doesn't always look like our language. So I love that Melissa's ready to adapt as students come into her space. And same with me thinking, okay, what can I have at the ready? How can I get to know this student and bring comfort by being attentive to their needs. And that often avoids the big behaviors because they're mm -hmm. already regulating. Yes. We also give more words to it now. I'm not a big fan of zones of regulation because I find some students will like naturally be red zone students. So if you're mm -hmm. familiar with that tiered thing, it can help for an awareness, but some students are, they're coming in hot. <laughs> we use yeah. that term here at home. <laughs> We're coming in hot because transition <laughs> can be upregulating. And so some students will always be teetering between orange and red. So it's really hard if their expectations to be in the green zone when another child's not so upregulated because their body systems aren't on fire. And often a student who's generally more dysregulated, they might have things like they can't go to the bathroom in public. So they've been at right. school all day. Right. They've been holding and they actually don't know their body cues until they relax. So mm -hmm. there's so there's some big ponders there. Um, so as we just, I'll see if anyone has any questions, let us know or anything that you love about ways that you co-regulate that you didn't even know you were co-regulating. <laughs> so now you have words for it. You know, one of my favorite activities I actually learned, I'm glad you have this slide up because um, Miss G at Academics with Heart, um, you can find her on TikTok or you can find her at her website. Um, she, you know, a lot of us are aware of different breathing techniques, but the way she talks about this with her students, and she's an educator in public schools, not in a private studio like we are, but she's just an expert at all of this stuff. And so I took one of her training seminars and the way she explains this to her students, I feel like is just brilliant. And she does a breathing exercise called four by four breathing. Yes. Let's, let's actually do it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So you can have your eyes open. You can have your eyes closed. We're going to breathe in for four. 
and I'm going to hold my fingers up. We're going to hold for four and then we're going to breathe out for four and we're going to do that four times. Here we go. So in for four, hold, out for four. Again, in for four, hold, out for four, in for four, hold, out for four, in for four, What this does is it takes you from the back of your brain, which she calls lizard brain. That's our fight or flight. Yeah. Fawn or faint mm -hmm. to our thinking brain. And by doing that four by four breathing, we now have access to this frontal lobe. Mm -hmm. We now have access to our thinking brain. Now it doesn't work for everyone all the time but it's a great exercise. The other one that she teaches is this, for those who are more tactile, you take your, especially your middle fingers and you do this back and forth. Mm, yeah. And nice. you can do it fast or slow. You can do it however works for you. And I did not know this, but students who noodle at the piano constantly, that can also be, regulation and self-regulation. Yes. And a lot of teachers have a problem with that and they complain about that. But that might be not, doesn't have to be, but for some students that might actually be a regulation type behavior. Yeah. I love how right away, for one, I just, breath is so important. And I think we can talk about it with our students too. I talk about somehow like with a student, I'll say, it seems like maybe you're coming in from a busy day. How's your brain feeling? And they'll say like, yeah, my brain's really busy. And so we'll sometimes add breath in. We also talk about calming our breath before we perform. Now we're mm -hmm. using it in all different contexts. And so I, I love that aspect. And then I also love that you've touched on something too, that we can observe a behavior that's in quote annoying <laughs> because right. I see it often in teacher groups yes. because it is frustrating. We're, we're trying to regulate our own self and we might be feeling dysregulated by someone banging on the keys. That's mm -hmm. totally legitimate. But like you say, some behaviors is actually a child or an adult too mm -hmm. seeking regulation. So they might have busy brains, busy bodies, and they know they're supposed to stay on this bench. But in order to stay on the bench, they might have to be pushing all the keys or they mm -hmm. might be the student that's pumping the pedals below. So those are early cues that if some of those sensory needs aren't met, they may start to struggle in bigger ways or you might have a big explosion at the keyboard. So these right. are little Little things that we can start building into our toolbox, observing behavior, seeking to understand behavior and think, oh, what is the need that they're seeking? How can we address that need? And again, we're not occupational therapists. Those are brilliant right things but we can learn from each other and so I've actually linked um, a couple occupational therapists and neurodivergent educators in this video description along with some of Melissa's suggestions as well and I hope that will be helpful I see we've got some comments here so this is really great I love that nap time seamstress oh nice to see you here today <laughs> how much time do you allow for co-regulation I find that I often get impatient because I don't want the parents to think I'm playing or just talking and not teaching piano mm -hmm. I love this um yeah. Is it okay if I answer and then you can definitely, type definitely. So when it comes to co-regulation, some of it may happen as a student enters, but I find as, as it becomes your more primary first language of co-regulation, for me, it starts to happen throughout the lesson. Yes. So some of it may be things like we said, like having a fidget or having a stuffy or, or that we're willing to say, learn all Minecraft songs for a year because that's what regulates the student. There's things like that too that mm -hmm. are more extreme. But I find when you start to have co-regulation as just part of your practice, 
we're looking for cues of regulation and then we go, oh, okay, we can adapt the lesson. Maybe we need to move more. So we're going to listen to music and color. Some of mine are real artists yeah. and the best thing to calm them down is to, is to maybe pause and listen to the song we're going to be learning. And while I play on the keys to demonstrate, they're actually keeping busy doing something. And what I find, and I love that you've addressed this, is there's a lot of worry for a teacher because we want to maximize value to families. And so I start working in that language too. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching if the parent's there, or if they're not, and saying, oh, this is a really important exercise for our brain our brains learn better when we start to find things we enjoy or however you want to phrase it. That's, that's what I think. What about you, Melissa? How would yeah, you I think the same thing happens. And this is the magic I feel like of understanding all of this um, part, this world, you know, and, and this idea of regulation and co-regulation is that the more we start to incorporate it in little bits. So I, when you, I like the question of how much time do you allot? Because actually um, I have changed my lesson format completely to adapt to SEL and to audiation and to uh, taking care of students' uh, mental and emotional well-being as well as their, you know, musical education. So my lessons are now 50 minutes long, and that is a non-negotiable. Yeah. And a lot of people are like, how do you do 50 minutes with a six-year-old? It's easy because we are doing so many different things during each lesson. Some things are calm and they're at the piano and on the bench. Some things are up and moving around to music and doing more movement activities and, and getting the you know person moving and, and doing some fun things, maybe using manipulatives or doing games. And sometimes we are just breathing to transition and to bring it back to the piano. So I do have time built into every single lesson, usually about 10 out of that 50 minutes is geared toward social emotional learning or toward mm -hmm. that kind of movement and regulation. Yeah. So yeah. the magic of it, though, happens when you do this regularly and you incorporate it intentionally, students start to do it on their own. Yeah. And like you said, it just starts to happen organically as the flow of your lessons continue and you'll be able to spot it. Like even if you have time set aside in the beginning of a lesson for co-regulation um, movement or breathing or whatever you want to do, sometimes you'll find that later in a lesson, you'll see that something has triggered a student and you'll see the anxiety start to amp up. And so you'll know right away, oh, maybe we need to get off the bench and do something with manipulatives. Mm -hmm. you know, or maybe we need to sing instead of, you know, playing something yeah. on the piano. So I think the more you start to do it, the more it just weaves itself into your lesson experience because you start to begin to see those signs in students. Yeah. And uh, same way. I give my students a music journal. Um, I did this this year. I bought all these journals for my students and we color and we draw and we write and we also do music in here too, but yeah. um, they have the opportunity again to get out the crayons or colored pencils or markers and, and just create while I play mm -hmm. music. Yeah. And I love that you're also building that into something that they start to have those tools at their disposal. And so then they're starting to, you're starting to be able to observe what they need because they're going in that direction. I love that Madison here mentions she's got students that play over yeah. her when she speaks or gives instruction. Is there a way I could help them regulate so they don't play the piano over my voice? That's a good question. And I, I think we'll both have differing ideas on this. I'm someone who, again, was always like, I feel almost terrible, but I was always like, you don't play while I talk. Like I was pretty, and I'm a talker, you guys. <laughs> like, how would they get a note in at your eyes? <laughs> um, <laughs> so teaching online has been the best thing for me because I learned a whole lot of patience teaching yeah. online. And I also like, learn to observe and this is something for Madison to I started to watch what Melissa was saying does it look like while they're playing the piano they're actually processing information you might have already given them they actually might be figuring things out in that moment or they might be trying to regulate so I try to observe what's happening at the keys. Is it because I actually need to stop talking and let them play and figure it out? And often that's actually what has happened to me. 
but again, I'm a chatter. Mm -hmm. Um, Or I also watch for clues of regulation. Does it look like they're kind of making music, even if it's not the what was assigned and it's slowing them down? Or does it look like they're actually starting to loop into maybe crashing sounds or kicking or so you're seeing bigger and bigger body movements right. then that right. might be a clue that they're actually starting to dysregulate and maybe the demands are overcoming what they're able to regulate so then I would think of some strategies probably away from the keys not that there's not room for respect and I love actually Tony, Tony Parlapiano does a neat thing with Popmatic so he mm-hmm. actually teaches this little thing that he won't interrupt their creativity and they actually end like with this end code kind of thing that's when they're exiting their time of creativity and that's when he has permission to enter. So I also think that giving that bit of autonomy and voice to the student and developing your own language of give and take is really valuable. What do you think, Melissa? Yeah, I love this question too, because I think all of us have been through this experience and I learned, so this research comes from like 25 years ago, actually. Yeah. Um, Search Institute um, had done a research study on middle school boys and girls and how they listen and how they pay attention. And fascinatingly enough, boys more, way more than girls, like two yeah. to one over girls tend to listen better when their hands are busy. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was teaching in another environment, I used to like where the kids were at a desk and they had to like sit there, you know, at a table or a desk. I used to give them paper clips. It's before fidget toys. Yeah. I used to give them paper clips and pencils and make them click, you know, and I would just talk over it. But I knew, and you know who picked up all that stuff? It was the boys. They yeah. weren't trying to be annoying. No. They weren't being disrespectful. They were trying to pay attention. And when they had the hands busy, they actually were listening. And you know how I knew that is I would stop and I would go, hey, you know, Joey, um, can you can you respond to this question? Or, you know, did you can you repeat back what I said? And spot on. Yeah. Right there. Now, sometimes they're doing manipulatives or they're noodling around on the piano. And they're not listening because they are in that creative zone. And it, But it's okay to check in and say, hey, did you catch what I just said? Or, you know, give me some insight. What's happening in your brain right now? So yeah. rather than saying, please don't play over me. Mm-hmm. And having the whole serious teacher voice, stop playing, listen to yeah. me. Yeah. Ask, be curious. Hey, what's happening? Are you actually engaging better and listening better right now? And did you, can you, you know, tell me what I said? Or are you doing something really spontaneous and creative that we need to do together? Like, can you help me understand what's happening right now? And I prefer using that question and being curious about what, what is happening rather than just shutting it down. Because honestly, I'm so over myself like Mm -hmm. in my teaching, a lot of times I'm like, wah, 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 the Charlie Brown teacher, right? You know, (laughs) just like, they don't need to know that. (laughs) We just want to play and have fun, you know? So I sort of have to release my own, you know, stuff, my own adult brain stuff that's going on about what I have to teach and go and be curious and go, hmm, are you doing something really cool? Do you have a musical idea that we need to explore? Yeah. Or did you actually hear what I said and you're just trying to listen better? So that's mm-hmm. how I deal with that. I yeah. don't ever shut it down. Yeah, I love that because same, I'm really learning that I like we've used this quote before in my live streams, we're being, we're teaching and we're being taught. So I find Mm -hmm. in, in my ability to draw back a little bit and go, okay, what's the actual need here? Or what are they doing? And like you're saying, is what they're doing actually them trying to learn what you just said too, Mm -hmm. right? Like how amazing is that? Some of them, it might not sound like they're processing what you said, yeah, but it might be. The other thing we'll be aware of too, is that sometimes that's a stim and that's a regulatory loop that they might be looping on the keys and actually trying to regulate another need like maybe they're feeling like running away because you just asked them to do something tricky and their anxiety is starting to flood and so maybe they're looping
working on something like that to try to regulate? So those are great questions. And I love that Heidi's saying she's got a noodley student too and totally think he's regulating now. So that little aha, mm-hmm. that's what I get excited about because I'm like, yes, right? Um, just yeah. that empathy of like, oh, okay, what is the behavior telling us about the child? And that's a really valuable quote. I've got it on here. And so, by the way, if mm-hmm. I can just go back to one little thing, yeah. if you ask, if you get curious and you ask that question, hey, what's happening in your brain? Did you hear what I said? Yeah. And they're like, oh, no, I wasn't listening. You can, it's okay to say, can you, do you really need to play that right now? And do we need to work on that right now? And if they say yes, then let them do it and then say, okay, now can I have a turn or now it's my turn to share something important to me. I want you to share something that's important to you and give them that time. Yeah. Yeah. And then say, okay, now can I share something that's really important to me? And can you give me your eyes and your ears? And sometimes that will help get them to get away from the piano. If you really feel like you have to have your voice as the only sound in the room, because sometimes we do have to share something really super important. Like sometimes I will connect with my student and I'll say, you know, can you give me your ears and your eyes for just a second? And I'll lean in close and they'll be like, okay. And I'll say, you're amazing. I yeah. love it when you play. Will you play something cool for me that you've learned? And they're yeah. like, oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I love that. I think that it's just so much about finding those little things. I picked up one of my fidgets. I was that student yeah, yeah, that probably yeah. would have, I think I chatted as a stamp. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let's get to that. Um, I So in this chat about connection first, here we talk about uh, we've talked about uh, observing and respecting communication needs, finding ways to support sensory differences, validating those diverse learning needs. We didn't always title it that, but I think you've caught that hopefully in this one. And the last thing I love touching on is gifting autonomy. Mm-hmm. And, and this is expressing that too. That I used to have a very teacher directed style, you know, because yeah. that's how we were taught, right? Is yep. just yep. like listen and. Um, And yet more and more, I'm finding that students, when anxiety is high or when stress is high, gifting someone autonomy to build in some choices surrounding what's happening is actually very reducing of anxiety. And I Mm -hmm. see I would have thought students would walk all over me and do whatever they wanted. But in gifting autonomy, I'm finding exactly the opposite. I'm actually modeling grace towards them and they're modeling it back to me and I'm finding that consistently. So that's something I love um, chatting about too. So this, we've got a few more comments. I put this quote up because it's one of my favorites, change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. So as we're talking about working alongside students with varying needs and challenges, a lot of it is our perspective coming alongside in their interests. And um, yeah, Heidi's saying she's going to try giving a fidget next week. Yeah, absolutely. Or try, if you need to speak while you're doing something, give them some Lego that they can click together. I do warn that always make sure your items are bigger than the spaces between your keys because a fidgeting student will find a way (laughs) to put them in there. (laughs) Um, So, and Heidi just says, thank you, Melissa. Very helpful ideas. And, oh, you're so welcome, Madison, as well. So what a privilege it's been to chat with you guys about uh, connection in your studio and ways to to make that genuine uh, priority of co-regulation. So thanks for being here. I have another question for you, and we didn't talk about this before, but do you have a story or an example of an experience you had that really made you go, wow, this is, you know, this is why I have to incorporate this stuff in my teaching? Mm. You know, most of what I speak from, like, the big amount of research I did was from family. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And we've got a very neurodiverse family here with uh, an autistic child, possibly Mm -hmm. giftedness and ADHD. So I think much of it came from seeing those needs 
adapting to those needs and realizing the beauty that it brought us all mm. with thinking of co-regulation first. But one of the beautiful things right away was one of our one of our kids was spinning and at two and a half years old, I said to the one child, I said, do you know why he's spinning? And his term was to find his calm. Oh, wow. So right there, that was quite a few years ago. And I thought, hey, what a beautiful thing to observe the behavior of another that wasn't as typical to look at it and go, He's finding his calm. And that wasn't yeah. a term we'd used. And that was a two and a half year old that observed a behavior and and saw beyond what we were seeing of just kind of look like it was spiraling out of control. So mm -hmm. that that thought of finding your calm, it's valid for us as individuals. It's valid as we work alongside students. And with students, the biggest thing I see is sometimes when I don't think of a behavior in that recently, there was some big behaviors. And I was thinking, oh, what's what's wrong today? <laughs> and I realized I hadn't done my usual check-ins. And there had been a big incident at school that day. Oh, and wow. the moment it was addressed in compassion and had time to express, the behaviors were so reduced. It was night and day. And that wow. was, a, again, another reminder that co-regulation and making space that's what it's all about. You know, like I am a music teacher. I want people to experience music, but they're not going to be ready to experience music or find that vehicle of regulation mm -hmm. until we make space to adapt the learning environment and to work alongside. So it's really powerful for me. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I feel like uh, I didn't really run into a lot of this until lockdowns and the pandemic and I had student after student online during that time where I, you know, <laughs> they were in such whew, yeah. anxiety and grief and confusion and distress. Yeah. And I sat, I, I'll never forget, I had a lesson and I had a girl who she was going to school online. Her mother wanted her to have piano lessons and mm -hmm. She wasn't practicing. She was depressed. Her friends were just, her friend group was gone. Mm -hmm. She had no, nothing left, yeah. you know, and I would get online and connect with her. And one day she was just not verbal at all, which was unusual. Yeah. And I just, I asked her, I said, would you like me to just play something for you? Something mm -hmm. calming? And she just nodded her head. And so I just, I said, turn your microphone off, turn your camera off. And I'm going to spend the next half hour and I'm just going to play soothing music for you. Wow. And when you're ready, you can turn your camera on or your microphone on and you can tell me to stop. Yeah. Can I just tell you that was a life changing moment for both of us because yeah. for 30 minutes, I just sat and played. Wow. It was, you know, like I've never played Carnegie Hall. Yeah. I never want to play Carnegie Hall. That's Okay to play for that one beautiful young person and mm -hmm. to make her feel better for 30 minutes. Yeah. Life changing. Oh yeah. Life changing. Yeah. That's what we are supposed to do. And that's what we're supposed to be able to give our students is the ability to do that for other people. That's mm -hmm. the goal, right. Yeah. Is to heal through music and to communicate through music. So, you know, over a screen like we are, I was able to give her comfort. I was able to give her peace and we didn't, she didn't have a lesson. Yeah. But what better lesson could there be about the power of music? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. So it was during the pandemic when I really realized how powerful this really was and why I had to incorporate this more into my everyday teaching and into my every week um, lesson planning. Oh, I love that so much. And I think that impacted Madison too. Like, isn't yeah. that just so beautiful working alongside? And I know that you here today are those wonderful heart-led educators as well. And I think that we're all just learning. And as we just build in the empathy of seeing people as individuals who are dealing with their own things and finding ways to connect, that's going to come out. And I think just also being confident in what you have to offer and that 
co-regulation, now you can think of it as, hey, I'm actually co-regulating. I'm not playing Minecraft characters in my closet with a student mm-hmm. to waste the parents' <laughs> time. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. actually like in tune to that child and their needs. And that yeah. might build into the Minecraft theme music or it might build. And, and yet that's the most beautiful thing, right? Is mm-hmm. connecting. So thank you all for being here today. We had such a beautiful time. And I know Heidi's feeling it too. I know, I know. (laughs) Thank you for taking the time to build your resources as a teacher. I hope it will be helpful. I'm honored to have Melissa here. We've had so much fun thinking of topics. If you weren't at our differentiated learning chat a couple weeks ago, that's another live stream that you can take in on the replay. If you haven't subscribed already and found value today, feel free to subscribe. And it's also, I've linked in the video description, all the places you can find Melissa and the beautiful things she's doing. She has some music lesson pathways, courses for teachers, and I'm just having loads of fun inspiring creativity here on YouTube and introducing contemporary composers and their music. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Amy. Yeah, you bet. We'll see you all in the next live stream.